Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So uh, welcome, good morning everybody. Uh, it is my great pleasure here to uh, welcome uh, Shiva Sundaram here from uh, the uh, University of uh, Southern California. He's a PhD student in the lab of Sri Narayanan uh, and is here to talk ab to us about uh, description-based approaches to audio information processing. He's a PhD student and he's actually uh, won a best paper award at a uh, multimedia signal processing conference in 2006, I believe, and uh, he's here to tell us about his PhD research. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'd like to first uh, welcome you all and uh, particularly thank Mike Seltzer for having me over to make a presentation at Microsoft Research. Uh, I'm Shiva Sundaram and my, the title of today's topic, uh, the uh, talk of today's, uh, title of today's ta talk would be Description-Based Audio Information Processing. And uh, let me introduce myself. I've, uh, being in uh, Sri Narayan's lab at USC, I've had the opportunity to work in variety uh, of areas in speech and audio processing and also uh, publish in a variety of things and work in a lot of projects in speech interfaces and uh, human computer interfaces. I'll be happy to talk about any particular project later. But uh, today's uh, title is Description Based Audio Information Processing, which essentially talks about multimedia content processing. And what I mean by multimedia and content is that multimedia has three facets to it. One is video, uh, audio, and text. Uh, in this case, a video and audio are opaque media. That is, if you're given a media, video or an audio document, you don't know what it contains unless you listen to it. And usually, text are associated with this opaque content uh, to describe what, it, what the underlying uh, document has. Uh, in this case, of course, uh, video, you can have varieties of descriptions or tags, uh, which essentially talks about what the content is about or what it contains and how it sounds for audio and how it looks probably for video. And how it looks for video is not so exciting to me at least, uh, but uh, my main focus is on how about audio and how it sounds and uh, what it contains. So to go a bit further, uh, the description-based approach essentially involves creating uh, varying levels of descriptions of audio and uh, essentially developing automatic processing techniques uh, to uh, represent and process audio at these description levels. At the lowest level is the signal level, which is essentially the actual audio signal you have. And from the next level would be something called attributes, which is some form of a coarse, low dimensional representation of audio. And above that is what I call, uh, or what is known as onomatopoeic, onomatopoeic description, where you actually t talk about how the sound sounds, words like click, thud, thump, and. What's that word? What's that word? Onomatopoeia. Oh, it means, uh, it, it's it essentially how the uh, sound sounds. Uh, words like click. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, thud, no, thump. I would say you ignore some of the aspect of a low level information, like emotion stuff in the text, right? which typically doesn't express that information. That's yes, really yes, level yes. Uh, the, that's the de detail level is ignored. Or only thing I'm talking about here is content, what it contains, not about how it, uh, it but it is essentially how it sounds more than uh, the actual other intricate content. And at the highest level, you have the semantic labels, which is essentially things like, uh, is this the semantic labels? And in conventional uh, content processing, uh, there's a big jump between the signal level and the highest semantic level labels. So uh, let me give you a, a bit better idea of about what I'm talking about. So in this case, you have a sound clip, and you have how it sounds, what it contains, and what it contains varying levels. So say the sound clip is here. So if you want me in the lo lower right corner, if, if, if I just give you that clip without you can't listen to it, then you can't really find out what it's about. So let me give you a little bit of information. So the file contains children screaming. So in this case, it gives you a certain idea of what the sound is and what it can have. But it doesn't also till, still tell you about how it sounds, about some perceptual qualities of the sound. So if I give you a little bit more information, say it has booing sounds, which is an onomatopoeic description of, of the audio, 
then you have a better idea of what the sound contains and how it sounds. So if I play the clip now, so you get the idea. So all these levels of description essentially talk about one thing but, at, uh, but give you different levels of inf uh, information. Moving on, so why are why is perception? So essentially, onomatopoeic descriptions talk about perceptual similarities, and why is perception important? The first thing is the human audition predominantly relies on perception. So when you whenever you hear a sound, you are, you have an immediate understanding of the perceptual qualities of the sound, and in general, the semantic labels or text-based indexing only capture the high-level semantic uh, labels or about what the about the content, and typically ignore the perceptual part and uh, some examples for uh, multimedia which does that kind of a, which has that kind of an approach is youtube and flickr which is for video and images uh, so but in audio we are more interested in perception and tag based indexing has limited use for it and uh, for in, uh, so f so for indexing by perceptual similarities you want to uh, not only dis uh, have perceptual descriptions to it but also be able to search through the actual media file and the ultimate goal of such a system or, or such an objective is to create a full duplex audio retrieval system where you can actually move through the varying levels of description and also search through content and text in uh, equivalent ways. Uh, to give you a better idea of what I'm talking about uh, when I say uh, moving through content, let me give you a demo. Uh, this is a, a simple, uh, it's an audio retrieval system where you present an audio clip as a query to the system and the system retrieves queries that are, uh, audio clips that are similar to the presented query. Uh, for an obvious example, so in this case, in the top part of the window, I've loaded a library, uh, which is the BBC sound effects library, which has a wide variety of sounds. And in here, I have a list of preloaded queries. So let me present this query to the system. So that's the query which I have presented and the system has retrieved a list of files which are, have, uh, which, which are similar to the query. So let me just play it. This is like an obvious example. But so that's the query and these are the most retrieved similar clips. So in this case, of course, the data set has uh, direct relevance. But let me play another, uh, say, uh, a more comp uh, better example, which is kind of my favorite. So in this case, I've uh, selected, say, a quiet small restaurant. Uh, so you might wonder what kind of sounds it has. So if I play it. So it's actually a very complicated scene where you have people uh, talking to each other and you also have clattering sounds of the dishes and other things going on in the background. So in this case, say I want to play something. So in this case, it has retrieved, uh, say, large open square, which actually has the same kind of uh, people chatting and uh, a variety of sounds in the background. So in this case, there are, there are very different kind of perceptual similarities that you have, uh, which has been brought about. This is kind of important when you're talking about unstructured audio, and that's kind of the main goal in this uh, area. Yeah, sure, okay. sure. So actually, when do you do that to prove our so This is something that was supposed uh, uh, in the call center package. We don't know where the caller was making the phone. Right. I'm wondering whether we'll be able to use your staff, for example, to detect the, the background, uh, uh, no, the noise. Or is that a little bit different from what I was doing? Um, something like, well, then a phone call comes in, even though they talk about something, right? But then you, you, you'll be able to realize, oh, guess what? You know, the background noise is actually sounds like in a restaurant, or it sounds like actually they are the bus, you know, or something, yeah. a train station. Is, that, is it possible to do that? Yeah, I think it's possible because uh, many of I've played through this uh, uh, system a bit, and I've realized that at some points, uh, I mean, the, all these sounds sometimes are also mixed together. So when you have a foreground and a background thing which are mixed together, depending on how the foreground and the background interplay in the audio clip, that it retrieves that kind of thing. So if you train the system in a certain way, that I think you should be able to do it. Yeah. Sure. So uh, one interesting thing which also came up was this clip, which is say synthesized air raid. So you would expect uh, some kind of an alarm going off.
right? So, 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 listen to the first clip that it retrieved, which is our favorite. So this example is kind of hits hits the point because uh, you see uh, in the first case, the query was synthesized error rate, which is somewhat entirely different from children booing in terms of semantic labels it has. But in terms of perception, you can call them to be uh, asked. Uh, uh, you can say that they are actually similar. So that's what I'm getting at when I'm saying uh, perceptual based similarities for audio. And in this case, what is the main challenge? The main challenge here is to deal with unstructured audio. When I say unstructured audio, it can have multiple sources interacting with each other. Uh, there are no domain restrictions of what the sources can be. It can be any source, any, uh, it can have uh, different perceptual qualities. And there are no isolated acoustic sources. Uh, in general, when you listen to any audio clip uh, in, uh, in any real settings, then there are many things going on at the same time. So you can't expect, there are no isolated audio clips, uh, sound sources in this. And uh, the main, uh, one interesting thing about unstructured audio is that when you talk about similarities or when you talk about relationship between two audio clips, you could be talking about different time scales. If you remember uh, different time scales, it could be something which, ha which is of a particular event which happened in the clip, like a phone going off in a meeting, or it could be about the whole clip, in which case it's actually a meeting scene or uh, things like that. So there are uh, these different things uh, which you need to figure out what people are looking for when you talk about perceptual similarities. And there is this ambiguity issue which I mentioned where you can have different semantic labels but they can have similar perceptual uh, categories, uh, uh, perceptual qualities. So the overview of the talk is like this. Uh, I'll be going through the varieties uh, in this uh, pyramid and the first thing I'll talk about is how I did that retrieval which you just saw which is uh, by latent perceptual indexing. And uh, I'll also present some classification results uh, by, ca by categories. Uh, then I'll also talk about how to us, uh, how we went about doing experiments for assigning onomatopoeia tags for audio clips, which is the second part of the talk using uh, describing uh, audio clips by uh, onomatopoeia tags. And also I'll talk about a time varying representation, which is somewhere here, which is a coarse uh, representation of the acoustic structure and things happening in an audio file. So I'll be talking about this. And then finally, uh, uh, I'll give, present a brief discussion of the work, and there is a little bit surprise for you at the end, which will hopefully will make you laugh. So first thing first, I'll talk about the latent perceptual indexing, about how I did the earlier demo, how, how the system works. So in latent perceptual indexing, uh, in latent document analysis, uh, what you do is you have a document, say a text document, uh, which can be broken down into units, or in this case, words. And what you do is you uh, try to determine a unit document frequency uh, uh, measure for each document, a given set of documents like that. And then you understand, or you try to create a relationship between the documents and the words. And uh, essentially, you can do uh, indexing of text documents based on that. So how it works is, so you have a set of uh, text uh, documents on the, uh, in the rows, and you, ha you choose certain keywords in the columns and you essentially try to de determine the number of times each word occurs in each document and by singular value decomposition of this uh, unit document coherence matrix you can actually map each of these text documents into a continuous space which is spanned by the eigenvectors of the SVD uh, and then you can uh, generate a relationship between the documents based on uh, vector similarities so how do we do the same thing for audio? The, for a, a latent document analysis of audio, uh, there is a fundamental limitation here. The problem is that audio inherently is continuous thing. Uh, you don't have distinct units, which like words for text. But in this case, what uh, we try to do is to try to determine distinct units uh, for audio clips. And when I say units, it's not necessarily uh, distinct segments of uh, audio clips, which makes sense. It could be anything arbitrary. And once you determine those units, you can actually have a, a similar unit document uh, co-occurrence uh, matrix. So in this case... So, so that is the analysis in terms of determining what kind of units you have is in the waveform domain or is it in the transform domain? Uh, it's in the transform domain. Yeah. Yeah. So in this case, uh, what we have is say you have a whole set of audio clips and you want to uh, represent them in a continuous space by latent document analysis. So you extract features by standard frame-based analysis 
And so you end up with a big bag of features. Now, if you perform uh, uh, unsupervised clustering, you end up with n distinct uh, clusters in the audio, uh, n distinct clusters of these audio clips in the feature space. And once you have those clusters, what you do is you can quantize each frame that you extract from the audio clips to one of these clusters, and you can essentially de de derive a unit document co-occurrence matrix similar to what we did for text for audio clips. And once we have that, uh, you can do the SVD and essentially map each of these audio clips into the uh, latent perceptual space where it's indexed according, uh, where it's uh, perceptual space, which is the spanned by the eigenvectors of the SVD matrices. Now, there are certain, I would say that these clusters, although I'm doing it in an unsupervised way, there are some things which I will talk about it later, what they mean. So, of course, you don't want to retrain your system every time you have a new uh, audio file uh, uh, arising. So, how do you represent a query file which is outside the training set? It, you again get the query file and you get extract the features and you uh, uh, quantize each of these uh, features into one of these clusters and you ha s end up with the unit document uh, measure again. And using the S uh, SVD matrices, you can do a, have a pseudo representation in the perceptual space and using similarity measures, you can come up with uh, uh, similar clips for a given query. In that case, um, for the text, there's no variability or whatever word you have, it's, it's a fixed one. Yeah. Now, in the audio case, um, you know, uh, there's a variability there. How do you, uh, how, 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 how does that factor yeah. affect your retrieval? Yeah, your question is in the next slide. So, uh, what does semantic index? What does latent semantic indexing do? What it does is uh, it 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 uh, has the uh, it, it creates associations with uh, documents based on the unit document occurrence. And the main idea here is to uh, reduce the noisiness in language. What I mean by noisiness in language is that the same word can represent different concepts, or different concepts can be represented by the same word depending on context. It, uh, that's the kind of noise which you try to reduce with SVD. And in the case of audio. What we do is uh, we try to reduce the variations in the acoustic sources. Since, uh, if, uh, since the whole idea is to do it for unstructured audio, where sources can be record the same source can be recorded in different settings, so they will have different perceptual qualities. But also there can be other overlaps uh, overlaps with other sources, which again uh, re uh, re uh, causes variations. And you can actually reduce the noise based uh, by SVD, and that's the kind of noise which are trying to reduce the variations in the acoustic sources. And in the in the semantic indexing case, you try to map discrete objects, which is say words and text, into a continuous space. And in the case of perceptual indexing, you actually explicitly discover units in audio, and then you map it into the continuous space. And you can have similarity measures in both these spaces. Roughly how low is your uh, perceptual unit? Uh, the unit is done uh, in an unsupervised manner, so it can be t it can be anywhere from one frame to uh, f uh, hundreds of frames. Yeah, so it's not predetermined. And they don't necessarily mean a particular uh, unique audio event. They could be a beginning of a clap, or it could be one p half of phoneme if you want. It could be anything. So it depends. But you're actually you're mirroring into the so, so when you say that, does that mean that you're actually um, Explicitly searching all these potential variant lengths, or you're doing frame by frame classification, and just adjacent things go to the same cluster or group. It's it's frame by frame classification. Uh, so once you know uh, where one f which cluster one frame belongs to, that's a quantization step. Uh, you can and then you know that each audio clip has say 500 or 5,000 frames. Then you can come up with uh, the unit document measures for that. That's how it's done. Yeah, but there is no uh, like uh, frame uh, interframe. Uh, merging or uh, things involved. It's just, uh, for this part at least, it's just been done directly. So uh, for the experiments, so for the, uh, this system, uh, to test the system, we uh, went with, this, of course, the frame-based analysis where we used 14 dimensional vectors, 12 uh, MEL frequency capture coefficients with uh, spectral centroid and the spectral roll-off frequency, which are commonly used in audio classification tasks. And uh, the data set here is, again, uh, we are looking at unstructured audio. So the data set used here is uh, generic sound effects library, the BBC sound effects library, where uh, the audio clip can vary from a few seconds to a few minutes. 
the thing here is that uh, there is no predetermined like duration of audio clip for measuring the similarity. Uh, we can have any arbitrary duration, uh, and it's not domain specific and completely unstructured. So evaluation strategies to evaluate such a system for unstructured audio, it's it's kind of tricky, and so we performed uh, say two two sets of experiments. One is uh, so one is for so if going back to the full duplex aspect of retrieval system, you can have queries by text and queries by example, and you want to see classification errors for the uh, classification rates for these things or retrieval rates for these things. So in this case, we have example-based retrieval uh, and example-based retrieval and text-based retrieval. Text-based retrieval is by LSI. Uh, for example-based retrieval, we do an additional thing uh, where we do actually a subjective test uh, where people listen to the audio clips and see if it's relevant to the query or not. In that case, they listen to the query and listen to the top five of the queries and see if it's relevant or not. And that's for the music or for text? That's for the audio clips you just listened to. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, the sound, sound effects library. Okay. So yeah. Like, uh, are you going to get into them with the instructions? Yeah. 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 So, uh, and then the another set of uh, thing which was done automatically was to see category wise classification or retrieval rates, where you had, we split the same audio data set into semantic and onomatopoeic, uh, uh, had the same data set with semantic labels and onomatopoeia labels, and see how well query by example and query by text works for that case. The first is, of course, uh, the perceptual evaluation, which is the subjective uh, experiments done here. So it essentially measures the ability of the system to retrieve perceptually similar clips. And it's difficult to measure it automatically because there is no correct definition of a correct retrieved clip. So to do that, we did it manually, where we had seven subjects listen to about 100 uh, query files. And for each of the 100 query files, they had to listen to the top five retrieved clips by uh, and determine if any of those top five are relevant or similar to the query or not. And this was done uh, using web-based uh, GUI. And uh, the results of the perceptual evaluation, uh, in this case, what we measure is, uh, it's an empirical probability measure where you measure the probability of uh, retrieving C or more clips, which in C, in this case, uh, goes from one to five. This is the top five uh, retrieved clips. And that's the solid line which you see. And the dotted line you see is the probability of retrieving no clips. So none of the top five were actually, me were actually relevant to the given query. So as the results, shows, uh, the results show that the probability of retrieving at least one clip is about, uh, at least one relevant clip is about 0.75. And uh, retrieving at least two clips is about uh, 0.5. And pro probability of retrieving uh, re no relevant clips is reasonably low. So that's kind of a good result here. And this was people listening to the output of the system, the top five from the system? Yeah, so they listened to the, uh, the given query, yeah. and then they listened to the top five of the return clips. Right. And then if any of the top, which are, whichever of the top five are relevant or similar to the query clip, they just mark it as yes or no. So um, this hasn't been normalized at all then. So y you also ran the experiment where instead of your system you had a random sampling returned to the user, so you could see what was the prior for the database of returning a relevant clip in the top five? Uh, no, that, uh, that form of, uh, say, I would say the ABX kind of thing, where yeah. you can also do that. Uh, that, that, that wasn't done here, no. Okay. It's actually quite tedious, because it, take, it took about maybe a little over an hour for each person to do it. So I don't know if right. we can, it, it might, uh, you have to do it for the same queries, and there are issues of bias if you get into it. Maybe you could do it for a smaller set of clips, uh, if possible, but it's kind of open how you want to do it. I mean, each has its advantages and disadvantages. So. Right, but I'm from, just from this graph, I don't see any convincing evidence, of not knowing the data set, that your system is better than random selection. Mm -hmm. If you uh, draw randomly five clips, what is the probability to have one of them Deemed as perceptually relevant by by a human user. That's true. Yeah, and that's a good point. Yeah. 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 I should probably have done that, uh, but it, it. Yeah, you could have done that. Yeah. So, and what's the? I mean, I, I guess there's a question about the, so the definition of, curve of relevant because, yeah. and I guess it gets back to the instructions, if any, given to the user. So, like, I 
Yeah. Can you, so, so that in the example you just put up before, you, know, you played the air raid siren and you got back to the, uh, you got like this children booing. Yeah, yeah. And so those are acoustically similar. <laughs> yeah, but, but you know, but perception invokes all sorts of other right. You you, you just know oh, that's a crowd and that's an area. They're not throwing. So like what? So if this was this was actually left open to the people, okay. they would whatever they deemed similar, uh, you could so in any way in any way they they want it. They can uh, they can either say no, nothing. Is, even if for the air raid, they might be expecting some kind of siren now if it right. sounds, but if, if booing is relevant or not, that's all open to them if they want to say. So it's 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 a very difficult thing yeah, yeah, yeah. to determine if it yeah so that's. So I have one more question about sure. that graph. Sure. This a dotted line at zero point two five. Can you explain? Uh, how, is that an empirical number or? Yeah. Okay. So how do you get that? Oh, uh, it's essentially the number of times none of the clips were uh, actually and none of the five top five were actually tagged as relevant to the query. Okay. So that's. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's the mass that's not in the rest of the graph. Okay, I think I understand. Thank yeah. You. So the next experiment that was done was to do category-wise retrieval, where we, the categories were again perceptual categories and semantic categories. The perceptual categories were used uh, were done using onomatopoeia labels, uh, words like bang, boom, uh, things like that, and then you also have uh, semantic labels, which is say office, boat, those kind of sounds, and both these. Uh, 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 test cases uh, were done for the BBC sound effects library, about 2400 clips were used in each case. And uh, so in this case, of course, the retrieval was measured for both text-based queries and example-based queries, and the results are done accordingly. So the first result is, of course, the query by example, where I present queries uh, or queries of audio clips presented to the system, and the system retrieves uh, similar clips. In this case, the uh, the blue line which you see is the uh, retrieval rate for the onomatopoeia categories, and the red line you see is the retrieval you see for the semantic categories. In this case, of course, they're reasonably close to each other. And the next case is the query by text, where I present uh, the text queries to the system. And in this case, if you, you see that the red line actually jumps. The red line is by semantic labels, and the onomatopoeia case, which is the blue line, uh, is somewhat the same as the previous query by example case. What essentially it, it points to is that the semantic, uh, well, I'll get to the conclusion later. So in conclusion, what we have done here is that in uh, a single vector representation for an order. Oh, sure. Uh, no, actually, I should. Oh, no, I should the other way. No, I, I should probably explain that better. Uh, so, in this uh, data set, right, you have audio clips, and then you have the text description of the audio clips. Is like it like that's a, the Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like, say, four minute warning alert. So, if I present that as a query to the system, which is a text query, uh, I, I do the classification according to the labels on it. So, that four minute warning alert is probably some, uh, part of the industry semantic label. And it's also part of, say, hoot or uh, part of onomatopoeia label. So, so metadata. You're talking about metadata associated yes, with yes, people, yes, yes, yes. So, so it's, it's, uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's like the first clip which I played where you have one clip, then you have uh, onomatopoeia booing kind of sound, and then you have the text uh, label to it, which is the category, so uh, children sound. So if I say give the query like children crying or children screaming, uh, it'll retrieve. Uh, whether it retrieves a booing sound for it, or whether, and that's one case, that's the onomatopoeia label case, and the other case is whether it retrieves uh, belonging to the same category. I think children's sound belongs to domestic sounds, and if it retrieves clips which belong to this, that's the semantic category which you're looking at. Is that clear? Or So that's the result. So the the thing which I'm, which I was trying to conclude here was that uh, it essentially points to the fact that uh, text queries are better represent semantic labels more than onomatopoeia labels, which are essentially perceptual categorization of uh, audio. Uh, so in this work, uh, what we've done is uh, create a single vector representation for a whole uh, uh, audio clip, which is which can have arbitrary duration, 
and it's also scalable in form of language descriptions, like this onomatopoeia uh, description or higher level semantic labels, and also, and it addresses the content processing uh, idea of, uh, uh, for audio without individually identifying sources present in a clip, and this is ideal for un, uh, ideal uh, ideal for unstructured audio and large audio processing systems. And some points to ponder is that uh, example queries are inherently spread. When I say example query, the whole audio clip for say three minutes is a query, so it can have a variety of per, uh, different sources in it in different times. So it's actually very spread in terms of per, uh, in, in the perceptual space. So it's a very spread thing which you're actually giving to the system. The system is trying to re retrieve clips that are similar to it. So it's inherently a very uh, uh, difficult thing to do. And in terms of que text queries, you can be very specific based on your description. So it's kind of easier. Uh, and one thing, of course, is of course how I choose a cluster. In this case, the clusters were chosen with unsupervised clustering. And uh, also, it, you can also determine how many clusters do you want. Those kind of questions can be raised. And also, you can try to do it, try to do it with supervised clustering. If I know some clips, uh, there are some audio uh, clips which are, have similar uh, categories. Can I put them together and use those as clusters for the unit document matrix? Can I do that? That's the kind of thing which I later I did, which I have done also. And you can also do partial matching, or even uh, this is LSA-based approach, which is you can also do uh, uh, other things like PLSA. And you can also try to uh, develop a time-varying representation. Uh, the next part is, of course, you will ask, how do you, do, how do you actually go about describing uh, audio clips with onomatopoeia attack? There are no da ready data set available for this case. So how do you go about doing that? That's probably what I. That's what I'll talk about. And also try to come up with clustering methods for different uh, clustering methods based on these onomatopoeia labels. That's somewhat in the middle of the triangle here. So the idea here is to cluster audio clips using onomatopoeia labels and words like click, thump, thud, burr, which are representative of the sound itself. Uh, so the idea here is to do perceptual categorization of clips and have Clustering based on word level relationship, and the main, I, of course, the main objective for this work is to build a content ontology. Is to have a way to build a content ontology where you can compute in terms of words and signal level measures. When I say content ontology, what I mean is that say you have so every sound that is created is because something happening to a particular object. So if you can actually have relationships, say clock go when alarm when the clock uh, the alarm of the clock goes off you can have descriptions like ring and thing and say door and you could door opening and closing have certain per qualities to it and knocking has some qualities to it so you can build a big uh, uh, structure like this for having some form of uh, semantic information extraction which can be used for say document retrieval or pervasive computing applications so why is clustering by onomatopoeia the uh, description important. Why is it interesting? Well, it's the description of sound, as I said, is primarily based on perception, and there are ambiguity issues when you talk about just semantic labels, because many uh, cl clips with different semantic labels can belong to the same uh, perceptual category. And this is also useful for the full duplex retrieval system which we have, uh, where you can have a tag-based uh, 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 retrieval which can have uh, different scales of uh, descriptions, say onomatopoeia labels or semantic labels. And you can do retrieval for both these cases. So what we have, what we are trying to do here is again, if you have say audio clips, you already have the sound effects library which has given labels to it. And the idea here is to assign appropriate labels to each of these audio clips and cluster them accordingly using word level relationship. The first thing is of course the tagging procedure. So here we have a whole set of audio clips in, and uh, we have people listen to this audio clip. This was done using a web-based GUI, and they had a list of onomatopoeia words, and they could they had the uh, the task given was to choose for each clip they listened to, they had to choose uh, onomatopoeia any number of onomatopoeia words that best describe the sound that they just listened to. So they could do that, and they did that, and you essentially end up with uh, uh, audio clips and labels associated with these audio clips. And in this case, we are doing word-level clustering of these audio clips. To do word level clustering, you need to have some idea of how similar two words are or how different they are. For that, we use this uh, method where, uh, say you have two uh, words, O1 and O2, and you pass it through a thesaurus. 
then uh, 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 a similarity measure can be done by having by counting the number of words that the thesaurus generates for each of these words, and that's kind of the number of common words. And by dividing by the total number of words it generated, you can have a similarity measure, and the distance is the one minus the similarity. So, for a whole a given list of uh, words, you can have each word described in terms of other words. So you have this kind of a matrix, and by PCA you can uh, again map these words to a continuous space. So you end up with a vector representation for each of these words. Oh, because it's it's a it's, it's a square matrix in this case, and it's kind of full. It's not yeah. So uh, of course we are trying to cluster uh, in that space, and you can have uh, clustering uh, fit measures like BIC, and. Uh, so how does this clustering look like? So here's an example which is mapped to two dimensions, uh, a lot of words. Uh, what I'll bring your attention to is, uh, say, words like sizzle, fizz, and viz, they all cluster together. And words like clang and clack, they cluster together. And they form also unique clusters. In some ways, this is meaningful because words with, uh, with why are these, what, what, what does this clustering tendency of these words tell us? One is that words within clusters have overlapping meaning. And for onomatopoeia case, this overlapping meaning uh, uh, amounts to having similar perceptual qualities. And words in different clusters are sufficiently distinct. And the proposed metric is uh, uh, works satisfactorily to distinguish these uh, differences. And of course, if you have these form of grouping of words, you can uh, essentially talk, you can uh, describe an, uh, both general and or, uh, specific properties of a given sound clip. And this is desirable for unstructured audio. Uh, I'll give you some examples of automatically derived word clusters. Words like, say, viz and buzz, they cluster. And words like zing, zoom, those kind of things cluster together. And so based on those word clusters, you can ask yourself two questions. One is, can acoustic signal measures qualify the onomatopoeia words, uh, which is, in general, it's popular to do frame-based analysis. And that's what uh, this experiment involves. And the second question is, if you have multiple tags for the same audio clip, how do you represent it in that space? And how do you cluster them in that space? So for, for the first question, is uh, we have a data set where you have clips and appropriate onomatopoeia words associated with it. And you assign features extracted from the uh, clips to each of these clusters and run classification experiments. In this case, we stuck with a Gaussian map with a, LD, a linear discriminant analysis to check the linear separability of these cases these words in the feature space. So if classification error is low, then it's good. If it's not, it's bad. So exper uh, results of that experiment is, of course, uh, what we realize is that some words are well represented by this kind of frame-based analysis. Uh, others are not. Essentially, this tells us that uh, each onomatopoeia, uh, many on all these onomatopoeia tags, they represent uh, di uh, information at different uh, levels of uh, varying scales of time. And for the second case, where you are trying to represent uh, words with multiple cats, you can get that by, say, a simple uh, uh, vector uh, addition of the individual vectors for a given tag. And no, we had there is no such a database for this work. We had like to, yeah, we, yeah. So what if the tag contains some music which doesn't belong to all this description? Of the whole Piece of music. Uh, we haven't really dealt with music in this way, but we have done uh, the next work. We'll actually talk about uh, MIR applications where we have done work in that. Yeah, but yes, yeah, 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 and uh, yeah. So, but this is like also in terms of we have 87 words, so you can be really specific about what kind of sounds there are. So we also have a little coarser measure which we'll talk about in the next part of the work. That's true. In this case, of course, we had yeah. some parts of speech of conversations which were tagged with murmur, like murmur sounds or uh, yapping, or yak, those kind of words. But they, you don't get to the speech content what they have there. Maybe some, somebody is making some view, you know. E, e, yeah, that's, 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 that's true. Classify those sounds. I mean, it looks like you have fixed categories on the sound, but you can swipe. 
But sometimes you couldn't, couldn't, couldn't really say what they are. That's true. So many, actually, when we did the experiments, many of the sounds were not used at the end because they, we couldn't use it because they weren't tagged, uh, because they couldn't find proper tags for it. Yeah, you're right. So in this case, of course, if you have similar tags to two different audio clips, then they will lie in the same area of the space and you can cluster them accordingly. So these are the clustering experiments for the vector representations. Uh, you can see how they, uh, you can essentially see examples of how they cluster together and what kind of tags were assigned to them. Uh, so things like say uh, doorbell and signal equipment warning sounds, they're all clustered and so it's, this is of course based on word level clustering. So if you're interested, I said the uh, BIC, uh, anyways. so I said there's a BIC measure which we use for uh, deciding the number of clusters, in this case it's about 112. So conclusions, uh, the main aspect of this work has been to tag uh, clips with onomatopoeia words, uh, labels, and this is perceptually less ambiguous, although it may create semantic ambiguities, but uh, it's useful to represent both generic and specific properties of audio, and it's th this kind of meta level, this is desirable in a meta level representation of uh, audio, and you can, you can use this to annotate a medium that cannot represent audio. Uh, if you remember comic books, words like bang or represent explosions or gunshots. So you can use it for that. Uh, some points to ponder is there are, there are some fundamental inconsistencies in understanding the meaning of words. We did the same tagging experiments with people whose first language was not English. These onomatopoeia words which I've used are specific to English. So we did the same experiments with people whose first language was not English and they came up with entirely different uh, descriptions. So that's one thing. And the second thing is, of course, even within people who use, uh, who have English as their first language, uh, it was hard to quantify this word to sound mapping. Uh, how different is thud from a thump? Can you quantify such a difference? But they are similar, but thud is similar to thump more than thud is uh, similar to, say, uh, f buzz or fizz, right? So how do you, but how do you quantify these things? And some words such as crackle, uh, say represent long-term signal properties and which is not easily derived with the existing signal uh, frame-based analysis. The final, third part of the work is mainly uh, to have a coarser representation uh, more, uh, and to derive a time-varying uh, time vector for a audio clip and which is, and this low dimensional, it's essentially a low dimensional representation where you can have, which is, which gives you an idea of the structure of the audio clip and we perform segmentation and classification in this, in the experiments here. So the idea here is, of course, you have, say, the onomatopoeia words which we had and they all, we all see, saw that they clustered in a certain way and in this case, if you actually look at it closer, you can see that many of these uh, onomatopoeia attacks, they talk about noise like say sounds, some of them talk about say harmonically rich sounds and some of them talk about speech like sounds. And you, by having this form of coarser grouping which is uh, somewhat supervised, you can uh, derive a time varying representation which will what I'll talk about which is somewhat in between the onomatopoeia uh, tagging and the signal level measures. And so the categories here are speech like sounds, harmonic and noise like sounds. Uh, the speech like sounds are say individual crowd conversations, laughter sounds. Uh, noise like sounds are interesting because you can have anything, uh, many things can be determined to be noise. Say s waves on a seashore is noise like and again machine tools are also noise like so you group them together based on perceptual properties. Of course this, this grouping is it's kind of interesting because it's uh, sufficiently distinct from each other and they are also uh, somewhat generic. Any given clip or any given audio scene will have one or more of these things happening together and this is also discernible using available acoustic features. So the objective is to derive a uh, quantitative measure and uh, the application here is of course music information retrieval for where first uh, experiment is to uh, de determine salient sections of a song and the second experiment is to actually do genre classification of popular music songs and you can use it for a variety of applications, say annotation, playlist generation, or even uh, bra quick browsing through the media. So I, to give you a better idea of what I'm talking about, here's a little demo. Uh, all right. 
So, uh, what we have here is a, a music clip and the other tracks you see below, the first one is the speech like activity rate, the second one is the harmonic and the third one is noise like. So let me play it for you. So what you see here is that as the, as the singer starts to sing, the speech like activity rate goes up. So this kind of representation, is a, it's, it kind of gives you an idea of what's going on in the clip and it's, a, it's in a, somewhat a, a human readable format. So the idea is to use these and see how well you can do music information, uh, 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 address music information retrieval problems. Well, it, uh, it's actually a form. Of, it's uh, we're doing a time averaging uh, over a window of about uh, uh, 500 milliseconds. So that's what causes the lag. Uh, all right. So what we saw there was that when the uh, uh, when the song was playing piano music initially, it played ha it, the harmonic activity rate was high, and when the singer begins to sing, the speech-like activity rate was high. And when the drum snares were happening, the other uh, noise-like sounds were going on. So how we did this was uh, get features uh, frame -based, by frame-based analysis. You get features from the audio clips and you s send it through a bank of classifiers. And that, uh, that what uh, derives, so each of these classifiers are trained to uh, determine if a given frame is uh, speech-like sound, noise-like sound, or harmonic sound. And then you do a post-processing, uh, which is the time averaging in this case. And we get that form of representation, which I just showed you. So uh, oh, of course, it says segmented audio here, but we also do a classification using that representation. Uh, I, told, uh, I told you earlier that these things, these groupings are interesting because they are well separated even in the feature space. This experiment is to actually see how well they are separated. In this case, we used uh, MFCCs. Uh, Delta and Delta Delta features, uh, and you can see that the confusion matrix is close to identity, which is desirable in this case. One thing to note here is that the training set is from the sound effects library, uh, which is completely different from the target here, which is the uh, 67 full length songs from uh, ex uh, extracted from CDs. So the training set is different from the uh, testing set. So the training set is used to get the uh, waveform. The test set is the music? Yeah. And yeah. it's confusion matrix? No, no. Uh, uh, this is only for the uh, different attributes, which is the speech like sound. The, this is the classification between those categories. Based on the music or based on the. No, this is frame based classification. This has nothing to do with the music, so I will be talking about the music. Oh. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, this oh, particular. So, so but it's, it's an 80 20 split of the sound effect. Right? Yes. So. Yeah. Yeah. So the two experiments, one is to segment vocal sections in popular music songs and uh, in this case we compared manual uh, segmentation, again uh, such a data set is not available so we had to compare manual segmentation with automatic segmentation and we did uh, try it with four different genres over about 67 tracks and for the genre classification case uh, we had a data set available which is through magnetune.com, they let you download their content unless as long as you are not doing it. Uh, for other purpose, uh, using it for uh, sharing. Uh, but in this case, uh, the labels were used for, for, for five genre labels were used, and these were directly available from the data set. And uh, the, the idea to have, the idea which was used for these experiments is that you, these were taken as a particular case of, say, comp uh, classification or segmentation of complex acoustic scenes. In this case, it's uh, the music information retrieval problems. So to segment vocal sections, uh, we went through empirical derivation and we ended up with a rule-based segmentation rule where if you have, say, S greater than zero, the segmentation is vocal section where you can have S as speech-like minus harmonic and noise-like kind of sounds. And here are the results. 
Uh, you can see that the false alarm and the error rates are reasonable uh, are, uh, are low, which is good in this case. And of course, in certain, uh, there are uh, certain. In this case, uh, uh, the the time instance of segmentation has been given a little bit of freedom. You can do it within so if it's. Your music, sir, you are using MFCC as parameter for custom being able to come up with a segment. Is it better? Uh, no, uh, MFCCs are used. So what? So each clip you send, you extract MFCCs from so that. That, that click, you know, uh, is all music sound. So what do you do? Yes. So uh, let me go back to this diagram. So you have music coming in from there. You okay. do the uh, windowing and MFCC extraction, and then the training part of these classifiers are those speech-like, uh, 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 harmonic-like, and uh, okay. noise-like sounds. Okay. Okay. So that's the training part of these classifiers. So, so separately. Yes, so yes. This is, this is uh, this specific, yes. I see, okay. Okay. But and then where do you determine where the segment is? Oh, that's with that uh, the algorithm. With the uh, 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 rule that we derive. The rule. Yeah. So uh, it's a, see, in this case, we okay. derive a rule where we have a threshold, and if it's above the threshold, we can start saying that this I is see. a proper okay. segment. Yeah. Okay. So, no, but where are the labels? By hand. Yeah, these are hand labeled forms, and they had uh, 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 these were used uh, done using uh, how you do it for speech for say using spectrogram, and these were hand labeled and marked. So the mark marking was done uh, uh, by hand, and then the automatically generated labels were compared with these la uh, labels to see if they are uh, matching up or not. And for that case, of course, there was about a one second window which was allowed, like 0.5 for start, 0.5 for end, because we are doing a time averaging. What's the number for classical? Excuse me? What would the number be for? So, so classical, assuming there is no vocals, but you could have a false alarm. Yeah, it could be a very high false alarm. So, yeah. Or it actually, well, it, what happened was, I think it came out to be, com sometimes it comes out to be completely negative, which a little bit of high parts in the, in the, I, I mean, it's, there are uh, errors in the, in that uh, representation scheme. So, uh, notwithstanding those errors, you could say they are, it's pretty good. Yeah. I mean, but the problem with classical is, of course, you don't have hand labels also in many cases. Unless. Well, I, mean, so, so I guess, so classical is something that's, you know, uh, I'm just wondering how your, the rules do under, you know, in a you know, very harmonic music that has no, there are no, right? So, so there's the error rate, so there's no vocal. No. Yeah, right. so most right. classical, yes. So, yeah, I'm just curious what that performance level is. Uh, actually, that we didn't do that experiment, and uh, it's the idea was to see whether we could use that representation scheme to do such an, uh, to uh, approach such a problem. Yeah, yeah, so. Can you turn on my back? Sure. Oh, the final rule. Yeah. If you have three classifiers, speech, harmonic, noise, the sum is 100%, is this, and it's normalized, it, the, the sum is 100%. Is this means that this final rule is just if S is more than 50% in this case? Uh, you could say that, but uh, the thing is this uh, final rule was derived after a time averaging. So you could, uh, let's see. So you could you could probably say that because but we are considering a window of say uh, uh, 0 0.5 seconds, so it depends on the number of windows in that thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah just simply yeah. to judge whether something is book or not. I mean, you just do some much simpler acoustic analysis. You can see whether how can read the text to judge what is book or not. Uh, I didn't get your. Over here, yeah, yeah. You want to see whether that particular segment is a book or not? Just yeah. So I think that that's much easier and probably more accurate. Method in speech analysis. Yes. Yes. But yeah, you're right. But the objective here was to see if you have that kind of representation where I have. Uh, so that time varying description I showed you, right? Uh, let me just go back to this demo. So what this tells you is, it's it's kind of uh, like you're talking, you're describing that particular given clip in terms of these okay. known categories. So you're but talking in terms of those three. Uh, they are normalized uh, actually individually. They are normalized individually. So, the individually? Yes. So, the sum may not be one. 
at any moment between those three. Uh, I, uh, Can we have them all three of them to be zero, for example? Uh, it's not speech, not harmonic, and not noise-like. Yeah. Then what's this? Then it's, 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 it's zero. But in this case, it's uh, 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 one against all uh, kind of classification. It's, so you can okay. always get one thing or the other. So you can, actually the si silence part was, uh, let me show you that again. Yeah, actually the silence part was treated uh, separately. Oh, maybe I took it out okay. here. Yeah, so essentially that silence part was done using energy thresholding. Ah, uh, 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 so we are done with the segmentation part and second uh, thing was to see is if you could do a classification of uh, music uh, clips, uh, uh, genre classification of music clips using this form of representation. Of course, in this case, we did a uh, set of experiments and uh, what I'll show you is to use AR, in this case, AR is the representation scheme or uh, activity rate representation scheme. So AR with a classifier and MFCC is used directly as a classifier. And the idea here is that when you use activity rate, it's used as a mid-level representation scheme. So it's like a coarse representation of the acoustic structure and you're throwing out a lot of signal level details information. And the idea of using MHMM is to keep still have those uh, detailed signal level information and uh, to see whether you can still perform classification uh, with just that low dimensional representation instead of the high dimensional uh, signal level representation of MFCC, which is both detailed in time and say frequency resolution. First result is of course uh, the MFCC and HMM based classifier which gave the best results. Uh, uh, and uh, you can see that there are some uh, 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 differences in the uh, uh, class-based differences. One is, of course, the rock pop songs were most confused with the metal, which is uh, kind of uh, consistent with all other systems in the uh, in other systems. And <laughs> and uh, the baseline is, of course, about twenty percent here. This is the more interesting results which we got from the activity rate low dimensional representation. As you can see, it's actually uh, well above the baseline, which is chance, and it's it in some cases it performs as well as uh, uh, the MFCC and HMMs, but in certain most cases it doesn't. But the idea here is to show that see it, it performs much better than baseline, so it has enough information in it to do classification, and. Uh, again, you can uh, find some uh, uh, interesting things. One is that the metal is most confused with rock, which is again the same thing, and uh, the vice versa. And also the classical is, I think, yeah, classical is most confused with ambient sounds, which again doesn't have much uh, vocal parts in it or other instrumentations. So in conclusion, the, of course, the best performance we got from the MFCC and HMM-based classifier, which, uh, which has information of the detailed signal level measures. However, for the generic pres framework presented to measure the acoustic structure, the, it's comparable, it's actually comparable to human performance, and the activity rate plus HMM-based classifier gave results which is well above chance level. And it, it essentially implies that it contains enough information to do genre classification, which is a special case of classifying complex acoustic scenes. Uh, and some points to ponder, this is uh, what the method presented here is an alternative method to coarsely measure an acoustic s structure of a given scene. And there is also interest in the community, uh, in the MIR community to see how non-musicians listen to music. Uh, non-musicians do not have notion of chords and uh, notes, so how do they listen to music and how do they appreciate music? This probably, this kind of work alludes to that uh, question, uh, as an answer to that question. Uh, that's the kind of the end of the talk, but I'll, let me just go over the conclusion a little bit. Uh, first, uh, what I presented was latent perceptual indexing, where I seek a single vector representation for a, a complex uh, for unstructured audio and we uh, we uh, tested the system for query by example and query by text and also uh, two forms of categorization based on semantic labels and onomatopoeia labels and the then we also see saw how to see how to tag onomatopoeia labels to given audio clips and how do we uh, cluster in those uh, cluster those uh, uh, labels and finally we presented a time varying attribute based 
a representation for a, 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 a for a given uh, audio clip and essentially i've spanned through these different uh, scales of description for audio uh in, so finally uh, so that those are the things and one thing which uh, uh is of uh, which you can say uh, empirically you can conclude is that the semantic labels as is is to cognition is same as onomatopoeia labels and auditory perception uh you could probably put it in the gre uh, test but uh, so the idea is to see that although the 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 uh, the cognitive cognitive organization of uh, humans with uh, objects is what the semantic labels actually represent and in this case we start off with the auditory perception uh, how do you organize auditory perception into categories and onomatopoeia labels is probably the answer to it and the ultimate goal of course is to develop a full duplex uh, indexing or processing system where you could move from different levels of descriptions and different time scales and i can do uh, query and uh, retrieval in the, both these uh, domains some applications for this work would be in social computing where you have tags associated with a variety of uh, multimedia objects and you can also use it for browsing and interactive media applications such as downloadable content uh, tivo applications i uh, and uh, on demand applications also you can use this for say uh, things like uh, spoken multimedia document retrieval or even playlist generation for some desktop applications uh, so essentially you we have visit, uh, revisited a variety of the basic process clustering cl segmentation and classification uh, uh, methods and you can essentially generate uh, uh, derive a variety of user centric applications for these uh finally uh, if, uh as i promised or i hope this part makes you laugh this is actually related to uh, other work which i have done which is in speech synthesis and, uh, and also some work which i have done in special audio particularly i'll talk about uh, a, a nice project which was uh, automatic uh, uh, synthesis of human like laughter for so in this this is related, unrelated to the thesis work but something which i have done uh, in between uh so the idea was to for emotional speech synthesis you will also like to synthesize other non linguistic utterances uh so for this case we focused on automatic synthesis of uh, human like laughter uh in the uh, plot on the right you see is the is is the blue plot is actually an uh, laughter clip uh, recorded and the so you can see that there are two uh, there are two things in it one is that it has an overall temporal pro property and second thing is that there are individual calls in it so uh so there are two aspects to it uh the overall temporal pro uh, the individual calls we captured it using uh, the general synthesis uh, uh analysis by synthesis and modeling techniques and the overall temporal property we model it using a mass attached to a spring which is a, a damped simple harmonic motion so by varying the uh, spring constant or the mass or the damping factor you can generate a variety of temporal patterns and so the, here are some examples Oh, uh, that's true. Actually, but even if you have individual laughter from actual people, it sounds very strange. So if you so sit and listen, do you get laughter back on the tag? Let's go for a little. That would be nice. So, th so this was uh, essentially the speech synthesis that I worked, and uh, uh, that's it. Thank you for your time. So, 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 what what agency fund this kind of work? You know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the laughter part a <laughs> laughter i know i think it was nsf probably yeah and uh, the if i'm right i hope my advisor corrects me later but the other part more were um, uh, agencies were dhs or uh, uh, us army a uh, variety of mixed security uh, well i i don't know yeah so i don't know the exact project of my advisors right belongs to but there was a uh, funding for uh, Uh, audio information and uh, music retrieval applications yeah so that's thank you, thank you.